a, a little devotional with us here. These are things that are on my mind. I've been very uh, impacted by the things that have gone on in our country over the past uh, couple of weeks, um, especially this past week. And I wanted to just share some things and, and to let you know what's been stirring on my heart and yeah, messages that I will be sharing with you that I'm working on now um, that God is definitely moving me forward on. But much is on my mind right now as I consider the world, as I consider our country, and as I consider the future. Our world right now is hanging in the balances. Our nation is on the scales waiting to see which way it will tip. And everybody feels this right now. And God's people are the people that have great weight and great impact upon the future, especially as we'll be, you know, we're starting First Thessalonians, but when we get into Second Thessalonians and we look at the scriptures regarding what is, uh, it says that the Holy Spirit is being restrained until he's taken there out of the way. What is that restraining right now? And where is God working is we find right now, not only is he working in and through the world, but most importantly, he's also working in the church. Um, and that, that we're in a sense that preservative, that light in a dark time of our nation. Even the last election, where the popular vote ran alongside the Electoral College, was a near tipping point. And over the last 60 years, you know, as I've been thinking about the United States, since the 1960s, our nation has been on a reprogramming beginning with our youth. And I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm going to share with you, um, especially if you have kids. I've been involved with youth for, for years um, through martial arts and through youth work and youth ministry um, throughout the entire country. But this really came forefront in my mind this morning. You know, back in the 1960s, you know, there was a reprogramming of our youth, of our young people, our kids. When our national education system abandoned its first most important book, which is the Bible, the Word of God. And you know, kids came to school every morning. They opened up in prayer. They opened up respecting the nation. They opened up even hearing passages of Scripture that encouraged them to love and to respect and to honor and to be responsible and to love their nation and their country, to respect their teachers, to respect their authorities. And we removed the Word of God and in that moment when we removed the Bible from our classrooms, we replaced truth, purpose, love, and morality for evolution, immorality, inhumanity. As not only did our government disregard our nation's spiritual life, but also physical life, where in 1973 we then took another step and then awarded Roe versus Wade, where abortion became legal. Not only did it become legal, it became funded, it became established, and it became welcomed. And from the 1960s, our nation went adversely off the charts, as year after year, our youth has been inundated and indoctrinated with lawlessness in science, lawlessness in morals, lawlessness in politics. And today our youth is told that God is not to be believed or needed and that man can handle his own affairs. And now we are reaping in great numbers what we've sown. Do you notice you see all of the riots and rebelling that is going on there? There are young people in high school and college age that are hurting each other, that are hurting families and businesses and hurting our country. Lost, lost youth. You know, as I was thinking about this, I want to share this with you, is right now in the church, we got a, a notice because we we utilize a program called Calvary Curriculum um, for our children's ministry. And do you know right now, Close to 80% of kids that were attending the church are no longer attending church. I want you to think about that for a moment. Kids that were coming to church, most children's ministries right now throughout the country are closed. That means that children, 
Not only do they not get the Word of God, and not only are they not going to school, but for those percentage of kids that were coming to church and getting the Word of God at least once a week for an hour are no longer receiving the Word of God. The support for children's ministry programs in churches, those ministries right now are struggling to survive right now. And I say shame on the church because the church needs to provide the opportunities and the classrooms and the online for children to be able to live at home. For churches to say, well, we don't have children's ministry right now. We need to have children's ministry right now because they're the future. It's the whole problem with our country is we've inundated our kids with garbage. And we're seeing it right now all over the streets. We're seeing it in their rebellion and in their anger. And so right now is a critical time where not just churches are struggling to get back, but the, the, what people are not seeing is the group that has been hit the hardest is the children. And I hope you see that. And I hope you realize today as a church and churches all over that the kids need to be the priority right now. They're the future of the nation. They need to hear the Word of God. They need to hear the heroes of the men and women in the Scriptures. And children's ministry right now, because most of our kids are spending time. We just had one of our college and careers. You know how much our average college and career kids spends on their phone and on their media? Five hours per day was the minimum. Five hours per day. And we must be able to get children's ministry out. You know, especially online. That resources and things need to be provided there for them. It's critical right now. And I believe right now that there's, you know, a turning point right now in our nation. There's a turning point over the terrible decisions our nation has made. And we will need God more than ever if we are to continue to be the United States of America. And I'll be honest. I'm going to say this. I was going to share this in a future message. I'm not interested in going back to normal. I'm interested in seeing abortion removed from our laws and Planned Parenthood shut down and seeing the Bible brought back into our classrooms and taught as truth and as science in the classrooms, period. I'm not interested in going back to normal. We need to return back. We need to return back. And so when we go to vote and we go right now, this should be the focus for the American people and especially for the Christians right now in America. Forget about going back to normal. And it is sad today to see how many of our youth in this nation do not know God, do not live for God, and how will we continue to have a future if God is not the author and finisher of our faith? You know, it's incredible today to see how many of our, our young people right now are very troubled about the future and of what their future will hold. And these are days where the future in our nation remains uncertain. And it is our responsibility for every follower of the Lord and every family to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is never, ever, ever in vain. If you reach one young person, just one person, whether it be in your family, whether it be in your community, it's well worth it. And these are days especially where parents and homes must take great effort to be prayerful, to go to church, or at least to watch online and to be active, and to consider what you will pass on to the next generation. It's critical. Because much of our public system, as we see, has failed spiritually. And we must begin to make those changes on our own and in our homes and in our nation and to vote for righteousness in the days to come. Today we are even witnessing, as we're here this morning, mandates forbidding Christians to meet in church in certain states. And the one message that people need to hear more than ever right now is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, in California, there's churches that are fined right now $30,000, dollars that they have inspectors outside the churches waiting to shut them down. There have been legislation to shut down the electric power to the churches in certain states. Do you know that there's legislation being submitted of what pastors can and cannot teach from the Bible? We see already on social media, it's no longer freedom of speech anymore. You should see all the stuff that's been removed from medical doctors who are Christians and from pastors and from people who are teaching the truth in these days. 
and it needs to stop. The one place that people of all nations, colors, and backgrounds need to meet is the church. It's important. And it's important more than ever for people both lost and saved to be praying, especially for the future, and for God's word to go forth in the power and demonstration of the Spirit, and for pastors to be both preaching and teaching the word of God, as so many are hurting and lost and so many are seeking direction. And in the coming weeks leading to the election, election means that which we are casting a vote for. Election means that we are making a choice. We're making a decision. And every vote matters. We have up until October to, if you're not registered, to register. And listen, I've heard some of the most bogus excuses I've ever heard in my life from people. Well, I don't want to serve on jury duty or whatever, so I'm not registering. That is lame. That is weak. That is wimpy. Serve your country and register. And most importantly, vote for, for righteousness. You know, I get a call, I don't know how often. You go there half the time, and then they don't even select you anyways, you know. I will be preparing a message sometime over the next month or so that we're working on now on life, being pro-life. And it will be unlike any message that I've given on the subject in the church. I'll also be sharing on politics and the Christian and also a prophecy update in the days to come. And these are days where the Lord's return is near. Just look what's going on in the Middle East and in Israel the rest of the world. Matthew chapter 24 is coming to pass in chapter 25. And these are days where the church, the Christian, the followers of the Lord cannot remain silent. And these are days where we must take a stand for righteousness. And we are commanded to do so. And as a pastor, I'm not looking to be politically correct. And I'm not here, you know, I hope that you're not offended by what I'm sharing, but you know what? If you are, so be it, because I'm not going to compromise from the truth, period. That's the one thing we've compromised in our nation for too long and for our kids. The Word of God must go forth in these days, and we must stand for righteousness. And I'm not looking to be politically correct, but I'm called to be biblically correct. And if you teach the Word of God, it will automatically speak to the political state of a nation. And our responsibility is to care for souls and for people in the church and to proclaim God's Word and to be faithful to the labor and to let God worry about the results. With that, let's turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Somewhere in the middle of the New Testament just after Colossians, before Timothy. There's small, two little letters that are there, very powerful, very applicable for the days that we're living in right now, as it speaks to us concerning, you know, the blessings of a God-filled life, and it also speaks to us concerning the end times. Uh, very powerful stuff that is here. Before we start, as you have your Bibles open, I want to pull up some map, uh, a map that I want you to understand the, the, uh, the terrain that is here. I don't know if we're able to pull up the, the map here on the screen. But I want you, this is Paul's second missionary journey. And for those that are watching online, you're just able to see the, the full screen. But for those of you that are here, Jerusalem is the starting point. And just to kind of put things together, Paul uh, was traveling up. Um, in this area, Syria, this is where Damascus is, where we know the Damascus Road event occurred. Um, Paul, as you know, went up to Antioch. He's known as Paul or Saul of Tarsus. So Saul of Tarsus is um, out of this region. He's traveling down this area where he meets the Lord. Um, his home base, in a sense, is Jerusalem, where he, he travels in and out. But then he comes out when he begins a second missionary journey, um, he goes through the area of Galatia. This is Ephesians. So as you read the letters that are in the scriptures of Ephesus, Philippians, these are the areas that he went to, the people that he ministered to and where churches were established. As you go up to Antioch, we see Philippi. And we're going to see this as we look in the book of Acts for a moment. But you have Philippi where the church of Philippians. And then the Thessalonians, which is Thessalonica. He then travels down from there to Berea. And we know from the Bereans in Acts chapter 16 and 17 that they were more noble because they searched the scriptures to see if these things were true. 
He then ends up in, uh, goes through Athens and Corinth. He goes through tremendous persecution in these areas. And from Corinth, he receives word back from Timothy and Silas regarding what was going on in Thessalonica. So he writes the letters from Corinth, sends Timothy and Silas back to Thessalonica, and that's where we have these letters that are here. Um, He will then continue his journey by sea. And then when you read the testimony of Paul, of shipwreck, of, of in the deep, these are all of things that happened on his travels, as you see through the book of, uh, through the book of Acts. He goes to Ephesus, Rhodes, uh, Patera, sails past Cyprus, Caesarea, and then back to uh, Jerusalem. So this gives you an idea of his circuit um, that he went through and of the churches. And as he passed areas, there were those who were running to him. He was sending letters back to address the issues that were going on. Let's turn for a moment, keep one finger in 1 Thessalonians. Turn with me to Acts chapter 16. And this will fill in a lot of the dots and things that we've just looked at. We're going to go through this super quick. And then we'll we'll look at the first portion of 1 Thessalonians. In Acts chapter 16, in verses 1 through 5, we find the launch uh, here for Paul's uh, missionary journey. We find here at this point, um, in verse 1, we find Timothy, who is listed there. Um, a Jewish, he's the son of a Jewish woman. He's believed that his father was Greek. Not much is known about his dad. Um, we find there in verse 6, the Macedonian call. And Macedonia is the region where Thessalonica is. That's like uh, the whole territory is known as the, the Macedonian area. So he's called to that region. In verse 6 it says, When they had gone through Pergia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. So God wanted them to go to a specific area. When they came to Mysia, they tried to go on to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And after you had seen the vision immediately, we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Um, In verses 11 through 15, he meets that amazing lady, Lydia, who was a uh, seller of purple. She was from Thyatira. Uh, She's there worshiping the Lord. He meets her there at the river. From there we find uh, this begins, in a sense, the church uh, at Philippi, of where we get the letter to Philippians. You should read these letters. They are absolutely incredible. Uh, and then from there, we find as as God is working there in Philippi, in verse 16, it happened, we went to prayer that a certain slave girl, possessed with the spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. Here we find that as they're going through the region, that Satan was at work, through divination, through horoscopes, through those people who are going and seeking the power of Satan for their lives instead of the power of God. And she made, she made them a lot of money. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaims to us the way of salvation. Do you know that even Satan believes in God? People say, oh, I believe in God. It's fine that you believe, but even Satan believes The most important thing is that you become born again of the Holy Spirit, that you become a child of the living God. That you put your faith in Christ. And this she did for many days, but Paul got greatly annoyed because she was just carrying on and carrying on. And he turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour, but when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. You would think people would have been happy that this girl was released of a demonic oppression in her life. Satan will always make you a slave, and Jesus Christ will always make you a son and a daughter. He will always set you free. And they brought Paul here to the magistrates. These men, being Jews, exceedingly troubled our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful to us. And the multitude rose up against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. It sounds like the United States of America. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the 
in the inner prison and fasten their feet in the stocks. But notice that God doesn't leave Paul here in verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. That was the number one song going on in the prisons at the time. That was jailhouse rock, you could say. (laughs) And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awakened from sleep, seeing the prison doors were open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. As a Roman, if you lost one prisoner, you were put to death. So he said, you know what, instead of Rome putting me to death, I'm just going to take my life. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and believe you will be saved, you and your household. Then he spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. And notice what the prison guard did. He took them the same hours of the night and washed their stripes. Imagine this guy probably beat Paul. And here he's seeing the work of God now brings Paul to his house and is washing the stripes from his back as Paul is ministering the gospel. Incredible. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. And when they had brought them into the house, he set food before them. And he rejoiced having believed in God with all his household. How Christ changes lives of an entire home, the future of an entire family. And you think of our youth today, and you think of our nation, our kids, and you read these passages and how we need the gospel to go forth more than ever. As we continue to to read on in chapter 17, and when they had passed through... uh, Amphibolus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. And that's where we're going to pick up. Where there was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul, as his custom went uh, to them, was there for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining, demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying that this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Messiah. He is the Anointed One. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. This is the beginning of of the church at Thessalonica, um, right here. And then we find there's an assault on Jason's house, uh, the guy there who took them in. And then you see in verse 10, Berea. And then you just follow the map that we were there, and it kind of connects all the dots for us. Let's turn now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we're just going to cover the first part of this, but this gives you a good introduction to understand the geography and also to understand the ministry of Paul, of how God was using Paul in those days. 1 Thessalonians, we know, was written by Paul around 53 to 54 AD from Corinth during Paul's second missionary journey. It is believed to be one of the early epistles that he wrote. And Paul established the church in Thessalonica when he traveled to the region of Macedonia in response to a divine vision from a man calling him to preach the Gospels we saw in Acts chapter 16. And after preaching in Philippi, Paul traveled another hundred miles to Thessalonica. And Paul spent no more than several weeks at Thessalonica. And the church took off. And during that time, the Holy Spirit was moving. And Satan was opposing as hard as he could. And this church was an infant church. They were new believers. They had lots of questions. They had lots of issues. And sadly, Paul was forced to leave Thessalonica in a hurry due to the persecution. And he left Timothy and Silas to minister, to guide and direct their faith. And when Timothy returns to Paul at Corinth, he gives Paul an update and forwards all the concerns and questions that the Thessalonians had. And this letter, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, is Paul's response, who we would send back through Timothy, uh, back up to that area to minister to the churches and to minister to us here uh, today. Thessalonica, as we saw, is a port city. It's a commercial center located in the northwest corner of the Aegean Sea. Originally, it was named Therma because of its hot springs, and it was later named Thessalonica after the half-sister of Alexander the Great. And Thessalonica contained a major highway as the Ignatian Way went through it, linking it to Rome. 
um, and it was also a link from Rome to the Byzantium. And this important highway and port made Thessalonica one of the wealthiest centers of the Roman Empire. It was the capital and the largest city of the province of Macedonia. At that time, it had a population of 200,000. Um, it was also a central place of pagan and satanic worship. And today it is known as Thessaloniki, and it is second largest city in Greece and capital of Macedonia with a population of close to a million people. First Thessalonians is a heartfelt, caring, and encouraging letter that boosts the faith of its readers while establishing biblical teaching and has an urgency, especially concerning the day of the Lord where Paul prepares the church for the return of Christ. And that's why I think this is just so fitting for now. Chapter 1, if we were to outline, is the birth of the church at Thessalonica. Um, it speaks of being uh, full of the Lord. Chapter 2 is the nurturing of the church. Chapter 3 is the affliction of the church. Chapter 4 deals with the life of the church. And the end of chapter 4 and chapter 5 deals with the coming of Jesus for his church. And then 2 Thessalonians deals then with the end times and the church. And we'll be covering all of this. Let's look here in verse 1. He says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. And so here Paul opens the letter identifying its authors. Um, the three of them. These are the three amigos, the three musketeers that God is using. And here you can imagine the church receiving this letter. All the congregants gathered around as they read this letter, you know, from Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. You know, Paul was originally known as Saul of Tarsus, a former Jewish zealot student of the great Rabbi Gamliel, who formerly persecuted the church, who was apprehended by the Lord on the road to Damascus. And as you see all of the geography that you looked at, you now can picture where all of those events happen. Silas was the dear brother in the Lord to Paul, who served at the church in Jerusalem. He was sent to preach to the Gentiles, and when Paul and Barnabas parted ways, Silas accompanied Paul on his second missionary journey, along with Timothy, who Paul considered his son in the faith. And um, it says here, he writes to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we find the church was not just a gathering of people, but it was the work of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of a nation. And he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we find people called grace and peace. Paul often uses these two terms in the beginning of his letters. Uh, they're known as the Siamese twins of the New Testament, grace and peace. Um, and Pastor Chuck often shared that we must experience the grace of God, God's free gift of salvation and life, before we can experience the peace of God. And through the grace of God, through God's gift of himself, we then are able to make peace with God, and then we are able to experience the peace of God in our lives. And so he would always open that way. And in verse 2 he says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. The one thing the church needs to do more of and continue to be steadfast upon is the ministry of prayer. Jesus says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And prayer is that communion. It is that communication with God. And Paul says several things here about prayer. Number one, how important it is to give thanks. Number one, to give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord always for what he's done in your life. And also give thanks to the Lord for those who are in your life as well. Be thankful. It's known as counting our blessings. And secondly, we find that he was to pray for the people um, as well. So critical for us to pray for people, to pray for them by name, to pray for families. Um, I'll never forget this. I was at a missionary conference and they had a map on the wall. And uh, one of the speakers went up and said, I look at this map, I have one in my study, and I look at all of the nations of the world, and I pray for each of the nations each day. And I thought, man, I said, what, what vision? He goes, I envision the people there and the salvation that God would send pastors and missionaries, that God would save that land. It's something that we can all do. 
John Phillips, a commentator, wrote, Concerning the mighty prayer life of Paul, it was an activity he practiced, it was an attitude he cultivated, and it was an asset that he exploited. And notice what he remembers about the Thessalonians. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. And there are four things that Paul mentions here. Number one, he reflected on their work of faith. As they were a new church, as they were new believers, they were living for Christ during turbulent times. They were trusting God's word and the gospel every step of the way. And they were also telling others and encouraging others to follow the Lord. But so important in the days that we're living is that we need to walk by faith and not by sight. Because the enemy knows, even today, just speaking of our current days, if he can scare you to death through the media and get you to believe all of the lies that are out there, he will get you to live in fear and no longer walk by faith. And that's why the Lord tells us that we have to walk by faith, trusting the Lord, even when the odds are against us and not by sight. Because Goliath is no match for God. There's not a sea God cannot part. And there's no nation in the world that he cannot impact. And so we must walk by faith, as this church did, and not by sight. And Paul reflected here beautifully on their work of faith. The next thing we find is the Bible tells us that faith without works is is dead. And so we have to put feet on our faith. And so the next thing that he mentions here is their labor of love. Their faith went into action. Paul said it is the love of Christ that constrains him. Do you know what we do for the Lord? The most important thing is the motive by which we do it. And we always want to be constrained by the love of Christ to do what we do. I love that word. It's the the love of Christ that that yearns, it, it pulls my heart to do this. Anything we do for the Lord, if it is to have eternal value, must be motivated by the love of God. The word here speaks of the sacrificial, selfless, giving love of Christ, desiring to express Christ through prayer, uh, through caring for people, and also uh, and also through prayer. A well-known preacher was once asked, "What do you base the success of your church on?" And he said, "This: the people love Jesus, they love each other." and they love the lost. The third thing we find that that they had was also not only did they have faith, not only did they have works, that they were laboring in love, but the third thing they had is they had patience because the work of God sometimes takes time. How many of you here right now, you don't have to raise your hand, are praying for a prodigal or a family member for years and years and years? or someone that has turned your hair gray or all your hair to fall out or all of the above, okay? That you have someone that you are... And so we find here that there's patience. Underline this, patience of hope in the Lord. Those are very powerful words, meaning they were living patiently. They were waiting for God's timing. They weren't living with anxiety, but with hope, with a certain expectation. They were ready at all times for when they would be together with the Lord or see God accomplish his purposes. And so we have to be reminded to be patient and not to give up, even though it is a long journey. And I've shared with this with you so many times just regarding my own family. Almost 20 years my family rejected me, and just over the past couple of years God has reunited that relationship. And So be faithful um, to the ministry of hope and of prayer. And then the fourth thing is they were elected by God. They knew God, based on his foreknowledge, elected us. How many of you know here that you are elected by the Lord? Everybody, right? Election is a beautiful thing. It means that God has chosen me. Jesus says, I I chose you long before that we chose him. And that's a, an amazing thing. And so God has chosen us to be citizens of heaven. You know, when a person gets elected, and I know people who've gotten elected to office, and they get elected 
You see them on you know, Sunday in church, and then Monday they're elected, and all of a sudden they came to church. Now Monday they're like, I'm elected official now. You know, I'm gonna, I have a position. I have a calling. I have a purpose. And, so, and people want to be elected. And here's the amazing thing. You're elected by God. You're elected, the Bible tells us, to be kings and priests. You have a holy and a special calling, and you should, people should see that in your life wherever you go, that you're a child of God. Verse 5, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the spirit in as much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. People saw the work of God's spirit in Paul and Silvanus and Timothy. The gospel is not mere words, but it is a costly message from heaven to earth. It is divine. It extends invitation. It wins, it warns, and it saves. And John 3.16, what is the gospel? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Romans 1.16, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. In church, these are days not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. If you don't know the Romans road, and I'll tell you what it is, the Romans road in in, uh, the book of Romans, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5.8, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans 10.9 and 10, that if we, how do we get saved? That if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is the most important part, and that you believe in your heart. Because without your heart being connected to your mouth, it's just talk. And talk is cheap. Your heart, your words are only meaningful if it's come from, the, from your heart. That if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, that you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. And notice the source of power of the gospel. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. It means that these guys walk their talk. They were their message when they went into these regions. I want to read this to you regarding the Holy Spirit. John Phillips wrote this. He wrote some great things. He says, Paul preaching was also in much assurance. Listen to what he says regarding the Holy Spirit. Paul preached for three Sabbaths. Countless people were saved. When George Whitfield, these are all-time preachers you may never have heard of, but you should know about. When George Whitfield preached, hardened men wept. Moody could talk to vast congregations, and each individual felt as though he was talking just to the individuals themselves. Billy Graham could preach to tens of thousands in the pouring rain, stating gospel truths almost unadorned with illustrations with practically no discernible outline speaking with a total lack of oratory or passion, give a matter-of-fact invitation, and hundreds, if not thousands, would come forward to receive Christ. When Finney preached, the agony of conviction that fell on people was excruciating. At times, his mere appearance at a factory would cause people to fall down beside their machines, crying out in horror for their sin. These are all documented. When Jonathan Edwards preached his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, People Fell in the Aisles. Smitten of God, he did not even preach it, he read it. And copies of it are still in circulation. The only explanation of such results is the work of the Holy Spirit. Thus Paul marched into Thessalonica, filled and anointed with the Spirit of God, Paul was as confident that God would produce spectacular results in Thessalonica, just as Elijah when he called down fire from above, just as Moses when he stood before Pharaoh, staff in hand, and as Joshua as he commanded the sun to stand still. That is incredible 
faith and confidence in the Lord. As we wrap up verse 6, and he says, what was the result of Paul's preaching? That they became followers of us and the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, and that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. Notice here the impact of when people truly meet Christ in their lives. Number one is they became followers of us and the Lord. The Bible tells us that we are both salt and light. We are preservative and we are to reflect Christ. And when the Holy Spirit is at work that you know God is meeting and ministering to, and that these people said, you know what, as Jesus calls the people, he says, deny yourself, take up your cross and come in, follow me. And so the people here began to follow. Three things that happen that Paul states here. When you live a life for Jesus, we find here, number one, when you respond, he speaks here of affliction, that they receive the word in much affliction. Meaning when you come to Christ, hell is shaken. You are no longer a slave, but you are now a son or a daughter. The Bible says, whom the son has set free is free indeed. And hell is shaken. And Satan goes to war because now you live and stand for righteousness and Jesus is on the throne of your heart and you're now on a mission against his work to be a light and to point people to Christ. The second thing we find is in the midst of adversity, they walked with joy. Joy is that inner peace, that inward smile that is untouchable to the world. It is that relationship with Christ It is given to each person by the Lord. And it is the experience of hope and salvation that belong to God and eternal life. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, we were reading with the leadership this morning. It says this, the joy of the Lord is our strength. That's right. What's the difference between joy and happiness? I'll tell you an illustration you've probably heard me say, but I I laugh at it every time. So you, you buy a ticket to Lotto. And you find out that you won a million dollars and you are happy, right? The next day you get a letter from the IRS, you owe a million dollars. So you're not happy anymore, okay? Joy is God gives you his treasure in your life and you are sealed and no one can ever take that away from you. It's not touchable by the world, taken from the world. It is yours for all eternity, And that's the beauty. So he says the joy of the Lord is your strength that God can never, ever, ever be taken from your life. Verse 3, and the last thing we find is they went through affliction. They were at war. The joy of the Lord was their strength. And the third thing that happened is they became examples to all in Macedonia, Achaia, who believe. The final result is that they became a living example of Christ on earth. When you come to Christ, you're never the same. Period. Because the Holy Spirit is in your life. You know, you are a man or woman of conviction. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, when the disciples were arrested, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And this is what they said. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. And let me tell you, may that be your testimony when people see your life. When they see that you're different from everyone else in your companies, your schools, and that they say, you know what? You ever hear people say you're a Jesus freak? That's a compliment, okay? That's a compliment. That you've been with Jesus. That you're living for Christ in your life. When your family says, oh, here comes that holy roller. Here comes the born again or here comes the the Jesus person. You know, or, you know, why? Because they see the work of Christ in your life. When you go into a room and people know you're a Christian and they stop cursing or they curse and they say, oh, I'm so sorry I, I, I said that. It's because the Holy Spirit is in your life and there's conviction in their lives because the Word of God says that the Holy Spirit goes out and convicts the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. It's because Christ is in you, the hope of glory. And you want to continue, especially in these days, to love people, to share your faith, and to stand in the gap until the Lord returns. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we thank you for Paul's letter to us under the inspiration of your spirit. 
Lord, I pray you help our nation, help us in these days to pray for the filling of your Holy Spirit in our lives. If you want more of Jesus, would you just raise your hands to the Lord right now? I just want to pray. Father, we ask right now as we lift up our hands as kids to receive, we pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon our lives to help us, to strengthen us, to use our lives in these days. Help us, Lord, to love and to live and to have great wisdom in these days to make godly decisions. We pray for our nation. We pray for the United States of America. We pray for the future of our children, God, and help parents today, Lord, to bring their children to Jesus. It's the one thing Satan wants to stop. Lord, help us not to fall for his tricks, for his division and for his deceptions. May we bring our kids to Jesus, Lord. May you pour out your spirit. I love in the scriptures where it says they brought their children to Jesus and he picked them up in his arms and he blessed them. Lord, may our kids be brought to you each and every day and on Sundays to make sure, Lord, and throughout the week that they hear the word of God. I pray that you help the church these days. Help us, Lord, to be what you've called us to be, to be strong, to be courageous, to stand. And we trust and we leave all of the results in your hands, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're able to stand, let's all stand and we'll close in worship.